Even though they do say the dick word a lot in this movie, which surprised me. They say it like four times. Yeah, I had to I had to stop for a moment and be like, dick splash? Yeah, right. Is that a thing anyone has ever said? <laughs> I guess maybe back in the day. And doesn't Lois Lane say a comment to the soldiers about Oh, like, dick measuring. Does that make yeah. sense though? Yeah. <laughs> the Superman movie with the most dick references. I'm Ryan Wright. And I'm Jerry. Welcome! To Reasons to See. Where we give you reasons to see. And not to see. Man of Steel! Let's soar. Reason to see number one. Fresh take on Superman. I really do love this movie a lot, specifically because this is a, a super fresh take on Superman. I, I've seen a lot of Superman stuff. I've, I've seen like all the original ones with Reeves, and then I, I saw a lot, even the old school cartoons. I've seen the, the Superman Adventures from the 90s, Smallville, <laughs> Superman Returns, a lot of them. I heard what they were going for, for a more realistic, a much more darker tone. And when I heard that, I was like, how the fuck would you ever do that with Superman? And they totally pulled it off. You know, just even from my limited scope, it was still like, this does still feel fresh and it does still feel new. Superman seems like a character nowadays that at least some people are kind of tired of or, or, or isn't that interesting to people, just it seems like. They haven't done too many like reiterations of Superman, you know? Be, like with Batman, they've changed him up so many times throughout the yeah. years. To kind of expect Superman to be different is a little bit challenging in one's yeah. own mind, you know? And I, and I really like that they took this sort of, you know, where do I, I'm the only person like me, where do I fit in the world sort of lost, yeah. wandering. And I know it's it partly borrows from uh, a Superman story called The Wanderer, I think, okay. where he is just sort of wandering the earth trying to figure out who he is. And I thought that that, that works really well for, for, you know, a new take on Superman. And also they played up, you know, the science fiction. Yeah, you know, the, that the was alien cool. Side, that was know? cool, especially in the first 10 minutes. Yeah. They really set you up for, yo, this is a science fiction movie. Yeah, you know? exactly. Like, it's fast paced at the beginning of the first 10 minutes, but to see, like, Krypton portrayed so unique, like, in a way that we've never seen it portrayed on a screen before. Yeah, is, it's is fascinating. It almost reminds me, just, just in in response, as, uh, like, Asgard did in uh, Thor's, like, people are like, how are they gonna do that? Mm -hmm. And then it's really realized, and, and then Krypton yeah. in this. This movie feels very realized and it feels, you know, it doesn't feel like, you know, silly alien planet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Especially in the flashback sequences, they have this very sort of rich Americana kind of vibe and imagery going around and it, it almost feels right to mm. me because it's like Superman kind of comes out of that era and then seeing truth, justice, the American way and like that aesthetic, you know, I thought was a really cool choice for this movie, so. But speaking of what you're talking about, like that old school American way, like I think that's why some, I think that's why this movie's getting very divisive crowd, you know, amongst critics and audiences, because we're so used to Superman being that, like, charming, really light-hearted yeah. type of uh, hero, you know, they, they that's why Superman and Batman have always sort of been that perfect balance, Yeah. but now with this new take on Superman, I think people are just having a difficult time accepting that, like, yo, this is extremely different than what we've ever seen before of Superman, yeah. like, it's exceptionally dark it's it's way way more serious than we've ever seen it like the tone throughout is very serious yeah like you would expect that from like a Batman film yeah but not from a Superman film and I think if you're willing to readjust you would totally see the art that they're going for it it's like they said let's forget everything we know about Superman let's just take some facts we'll you know give a modern-day interpretation of it and yeah. I thought they totally executed it perfectly it is it is very much a film of, of our time of this point in time. Reason to see number two, Henry Cavill. Now speaking of fresh take of Superman, this is a, he's yeah. probably the, one of the bigger reasons this is a fresh take on Superman. Some people are saying like he loses the charm and I'm, I didn't think so. I thought no, like I thought for a dark, serious character, he still had a level of charm there to, you know, to back it up. And you can still see like, no, it's still Superman, just a much more darker version. And yeah, he's, I mean, he's awesome at it. You can see, you can, you can feel the struggle and there's something, I like watching him because you can always tell that there's something going on underneath the surface. Yeah. He doesn't talk a lot, but I mean... You know, you, you get the struggle between I am not 
of this world, where do I belong? And also yeah. that sort of, I'm a kid from Kansas, you know, like. Yeah, kind of like that a wanderer, push. lost boy, observing kind of alien from another planet, you know, like yeah. it, it makes sense for him to be this sort of quiet, you know, like the, a lot of the choices that they made with how they're gonna portray Superman specifically. When I was watching, I was going, why, why how come no one thought of this before? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because this makes more sense in a real world for a, a kid to be this way. Yeah, exactly. Like more of the outsider, more of like the, James Dean kind of guy. Yeah, exactly. You know? exactly. Rebel without a cape. <laughs> I did notice his chest hair was popping out through his, his, uh, his Superman <laughs> outfit. I noticed that because I figured you would notice that. <laughs> yeah. And I think this Superman 2 is a lot more identifiable than any Superman we've gotten before. Everyone's felt like they don't belong before and I thought that was a cool thing to play with. He is a little more accessible to people and he is a little more conflicted that way. As a personal opinion, I think a lot of us, well, I think all of us have a certain sense of loneliness and, you know, to tap into that with Clark Kent is very interesting. And there's this great talk in uh, Kill Bill Volume 2 about how Superman's uh, secret identity is really Clark Kent and the real identity of Superman is Superman. <laughs> you yeah, know, it's Kal-El. Kal and in this movie, you really do get that sense. Like, you're watching Kal-El for this movie. Yeah. You're not necessarily watching Clark Kent being this yeah. guy. You're watching Kal-El. He's not jumping into phone booths and stuff like <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> Just taking yeah. off the suit around. I do always wonder how he fits that cape inside of his, like, clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Rule that he just never takes that sport coat off. <laughs> but yeah, no, it is more of a Kal-El movie than it is a Clark Kent movie. They call him Cal more than they call yeah. him Clark. Yeah, yeah. his yeah. name is Cal, basically. Yeah. Reason to see number three. Fresh take on Lois Lane. Amy Adams, man. Amy Adams, she's beautiful. Yeah. I like watching her. At first, I was a little confused. She was showing up at the ship and everything. I'm like, is she gonna find out who this guy is? <laughs> and I, I thought that was smart, actually. Eventually, like, you know, everyone knows how it always goes with Superman and Lois Lane. There's the Clark Kent Lois story, and then she falls in love with Superman, but she doesn't know he's really Clark. And yeah. But yeah, no, with this movie, to see Lois Lane know who Superman is up front, you know, and like actually investigate it and figure it out, that, that made so much sense. Like, like I said earlier, like, how can we never thought Lois Lane was capable of this before? You know? Well, yeah, she's not just a damsel in distress in this movie. Like, she's actually, you know, she's gutsy, she's a reporter, you know, she, she's used to, you know, weaseling her way into situations to get the, the scoops and the hard hitting. Yeah. You know, Evidence. I mean, I thought there was a little bit of an underdevelopment with the character. Like, just a, a slight underdevelopment. Like, I don't feel like we, out of all the characters, I feel like she was the one we got to know the least out of the iconic characters of the Superman movies yeah. that we really know. Even so, like, they set her up at least well enough to explore her for a sequel. Yeah, and explore the relationship between her and uh, Kal-El even yeah. more. And that's what's cool. It's like, you're seeing Lois Lane falling in love with Kal-El. Yeah. Not Clark Kent or Superman. You're like, you're falling in love with Kal-El. Like, she knows who this guy is and she's falling in love with that guy. I also enjoy as an extension of that the way that Coda becomes the surprise is when he shows up as Clark not Clark as Superman. Although I thought there was some lack of romance going on I, I thought that her and uh, Cavill played off each other very well too. Yeah they, they have a good relationship and they have a good interaction and then they gave her a bit more of a substantial you know role. You can see the the intrigue between the two of them. Yeah. Like, it makes sense that way. I just like how it wasn't another ignorant damsel in distress story. Like, yeah, exactly. to call someone a great fucking reporter <laughs> and then to not be able to see, like, Clark can't work at the Daily Planet as Superman. <laughs> it yeah. would be, like, the stupidest reporter ever. Reason to see number four. Action and effects. Wow, what a, what a movie with action and effects. Mm -hmm. Even in the first 10 minutes, that's what I thought was cool in the first 10 minutes. They made Jarrell a badass. Like, yeah. he was kicking ass and everything. It's like, this, yeah. is, this is a scientist who has the, the all the knowledge in the, of Krypton, yeah. and now he's kicking ass at the same time. Yeah, he's and not, it makes sense, He's too. not Arnold, but he can take care of himself. Yeah, he's know? like shooting up guys, taking on Zod and stuff. Yeah. First 10 minutes sets up essentially what the tone and the style will be pretty much for most of the movie. Mm -hmm. And then at one point it becomes like 45 minutes of, it's not like one long action scene like a Transformers movie, but it's, just, <laughs> it's kind of like non-stop action. Yeah, there, yeah. There, there does become a lot of action when, when Zod and his people finally full out invade. It's all good, it's all well executed and the effects are, are great. For me, a little bit it became just like, 
there's so much action and so kinetic that it was a little much for me. And that's not to say the story goes away at all, but, but you know, there was, it does go from being like lots and lots of story to like, whoa, really big action. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. it kind of feels like it's of a slightly different movie. I mean, I personally didn't feel that way. Like, I, I mean, there was a moment where I was like, there's a, there's a little too much action right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but there's, there's like, I remember having that thought of, like one time. For most of it, it's still like, you're not zoning out through it. Like, it's still badass. Yeah. It's incredible action sequences that it's that, just at warp speed. Like, yes. Like, yeah. Whoa. <laughs> that level of intensity with the action makes sense of where the story is currently going yeah. at that moment. And it's not gratuitous that way. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it, it makes sense, you know. The scenes were just beautiful. Like I love that action scene in the small town where uh, he's taking on the two people yeah. from uh, from Zod's team. Yes, this is how Superman would have a fist fight. It was so unique, and it, and the effects made it look very believable. Oh. I never got pulled out going like, those are effects. Like, it was always cool. I found myself going, dang, that's <laughs> badass. Oh, shit, what? That fight with Zod and uh, Superman at the end, the, the oh, yeah. talk about giving the audience what they probably want. <laughs> well, know? and that 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 fight specifically is is a bit it's like it's different because it's it's more intimate so it, in a in a weird way. When yeah. it's just them two showing down, I thought that fight was was incredible. It's in a lot of ways what you know in the Matrix Revolutions, they had Neo and Smith go at it at a city. And a lot of people didn't like that for this fight. In this one, though, I, I, it's like, no, you hear Superman and Zod going at it, and they do it in the way like, yes, that is how an imagination should go. Yeah, <laughs> that exactly. is perfect. Well, Let's fuck it up Metropolis and turn it into the city of ruins. And, and also with the effects, I gotta say, I, I, I dug their tech. Like, all their mm. weird uh, sort of Kryptonian oh, yeah. technology and stuff like, like that. Like the faces appearing that talk to you. Yeah, and, like the, the and it's all very It's elemental. not just holograms. It's, yeah, it's Elements. It's, it's yeah. elemental, yeah. It's like you, it's actual tangible, like shifting. I don't know. It was cool that way. It was yeah, like, they, they created a, a great world. Oh, and the way he flies and stuff—that was so fucking cool. Like it's always like. Wow. Yeah, they, they really played with... It's like with, sonic boom, you know? Yeah, yeah. They, they really played with, like, sound barriers and stuff like that. The things that happen when stuff flies fast. Yeah, I know this isn't a category, but the sound effects are really cool, too. Yeah, definitely. Sound effects are they're so effects. taken... They're taken for granted, it's sound, man. And the sound in this is really cool, too. Well, they, they say, the like... punches and stuff, I really... Uh, you, you feel the hits, yeah. They say, like, the best effects are the stuff you don't realize are there. And I feel like sound gets that, but, like to the worst degree because you don't realize they're there and then you don't realize and then you just take them for granted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, definitely. I mean, the sound design and everything is great. Yeah, from, from visual to special to sound, like all the effects are great. Reason to see number five, Michael Shannon. General Zod, General Zod from the uh... I will find I him! I will find him! <laughs> he says it like nine times and then he finally shines. <laughs> yeah. That scene was so funny. Just because it was like, he says it, he says it again and you're like, is this an alternate take? Is he gonna say it more times? And then he finally does say it and you're like, there it is! And like, he said it! No, he's, Shannon is, is cool. Shannon is always good. Like yeah. everyone knows that about yeah. Even if you haven't seen a lot of Michael Shannon performances, I'm sure you heard this guy never does a bad job. Yeah, you didn't you don't need to have seen any of his movies to know that Michael Shannon is a crazy awesome actor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, he's, he's, I don't think he's like one of the best villains of all time we've seen in a superhero movie. But for what they, they provide, you know, he's, he, for the most part, he's a fully developed villain. You you get him because of, you know, like how on Krypton they say they, the, all the babies are genetically made and, you yeah, know, sure. they, they are all like have a purpose before they're, you know, brought into life. And so it makes sense for Zod to be this guy. Yeah. And... Shannon portrays him perfectly. He gives it. He doesn't play him like I'm an evil guy. He, no, he, and he's a human. You know. That's what is so great is that every every scene he was in, I could totally tell that th this guy believes in what he's doing. He yeah. believes that what he's doing is right because that's what he's supposed to do. Yeah. And that's the biggest strength to his performance is you can you can just tell that he believes it so hard. Yeah, because there's a lot of it has to do with like yeah, he's just not some evil guy with like a power trip. He's like, not a mustache. He, he really thinks like, no, I'm doing this because I love Krypton. Yeah, I'm doing this because doing for, this the, for my people. Yeah, he thinks he's doing it for the better good, you know. But it, it's it's a debate with this guy, it, you know. He he goes toe to toe with debates with the ghost of Jor-el. Yeah, you know, like this dude seriously has like messed up philosophies going on, and he's trying to execute them at the same time. He's but, a soldier, you know. He he is a he's like a warlord in a way. 
Well, yeah, but but that's that's what informs his mind, you know. It's like that's if he was indeed like a, like an engineered, you know, mm. being. It's like that's what drives him. That's what informs his very existence, and that's why that speech he gives to Henry Cavill towards the end is uh, that moment. He just crushed that because it was like, you know, I have no more people. Yeah, it's weird. I have no I purpose. Felt that now. Like, I, in a weird way, I like sort of felt that for him. Yeah, I was like, like this guy's whole world is gone. Like, yeah. he has not like the whole reason. He doesn't exist for a purpose anymore because his purpose is moot. And like that's I, I thought that was great, you know? And he's a great antagonist for Superman. Like perfect first villain for this movie. Eh? Because I thought there was just the right amount of emphasis on him. Usually in these movies, when it comes to, you know, a, a reboot of an origin tale, they don't give a lot of emphasis on the villain or they give too much emphasis on the villain. This one I thought they gave just the right amount. He fits into this ensemble in the world perfectly. And I'm and as playing an antagonist to Superman. Perfect, I want to say equal, but there was just enough more of Zod to be like, yes, he is a good threat to uh, to Kal El, he has all the knowledge of Krypton. He has the experience of being like a murderer. And then when he comes to Earth, he's developing the powers that Kal El has that when he comes cool. to Earth. And it was cool how because I remember in the in Superman Part Two, the one that took place after the Donner one, he was he was just re readjusting to everything really well. So yeah, <laughs> sure. it's like yeah, I got a handle on this shit. But in this one, it was cool to see him explore that, and it made sense too when he got a hold of it. When he's like, I've been trained to master my senses. I was programmed to master my senses. That's why I'm able to keep up with you, man. So yeah. don't try to defeat me because I will fuck you up. Well, and I think that Zod is a great choice as a villain generally because it's like, it all ties back into the core of the movie because <clears throat> it's like, Krypton has been destroyed. Yeah. That's the whole reason Clark is on Earth you know, that they're both sort of orphaned from this planet in a way. Yeah. And it's two sides of a coin. So I think that's a really cool way to bring this new story in because it's all, it all hits home that way. You got Clark, who's this guy who's lost and comes from another planet and doesn't really know a lot about his history and stuff like that. And he's, he's in a search for that. And then you got Zod, the one person alive who is like him, <laughs> you know? And his, and his comrade. Technically, like... The one sort of family member, you know, in a way that he's got left, but but who's heartbroken because they lost the blood. So they both come from a similar origin, you know. Like yeah. that, it was cool to see them go toe to toe. I like how they have the genetically engineered like children on Krypton. They always say the last son of Krypton, the last son of Krypton, but. If Zod was a natural born baby, he wouldn't be the last son of Krypton anymore. Yeah. So they still they still keep it as he is the last son of Krypton, Superman. Yeah. I think it's easy to take his performance for granted in this movie. Mm. Just because because he's Michael Shannon. Michael Shannon knows how to portray a guy well and work well with other cast members. He doesn't so, chew up the screen. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, he's he's not like this big outlandish performance. <laughs> <laughs> Superman, I will defeat you. I will find you. I, you will do this for me, Huntsman. <laughs> yeah, but just because Michael Shannon emb embodies it and does it subtly in a way, mm -hmm. you, people might not notice. Like, no, this guy does a great fucking job in the movie. Plus, he rocks a crazy goatee. Reason to see number six: directing and cinematography. I feel like Zack Snyder was really influenced by like Chris Nolan's directing and J.J. Abrams directing. I'm just happy there's a Zack Snyder movie out where we're not gonna have to endure endless uh, slow mo jokes. Oh yeah, no, because <laughs> there's no slow motion, so he must have been listening to somebody. <laughs> it was a totally different uh, style than I've ever seen this guy do before. Like it was handheld for most of it. Yeah, a handheld a uh, Superman movie sounds weird, but yeah. it actually worked for this specific take. It it brought that sense of real and darkness behind it yeah. and Snyder's choice on it was cool I like his choices to have like the uh the, the camera zoom in on like the crash zooms on like a lot of the CG effects and stuff to add that sense of realism. Something I think he, he saw from J.J. Abrams. Yeah. You know, it, it was a, it was a great take, and and I love the tone that he established too. Like it was because you're doing when you're doing a lot of like cutting back between past and present and other characters, you, it's hard to find that tone where yes, it'll all make sense. But he he found the perfect tone for this film. Well, and and he intercut. It seemed like he knew he had a good sense of when to go from present. To to flashbacks, yeah. when to go back and explain things about Clark's uh, about you know Superman. It's Zack Snyder. The movie looks great, and I like the juxtaposition you have between the sort of grungier, grittier present day cinematography yeah, yeah. and then the really rich, vibrant you know flashbacks. 
cinematography. Just honestly, like this whole movie looked awesome. There was such a grittiness behind every single shot. You know, like he has an incredible cinematographer working on this film mm -hmm. because it, every shot looked cool and it it it, it, it looked real. It, mm -hmm. That's what I like. It felt real and it, and it felt alive. Everything about it felt so cool. But I, I felt like Snyder and uh, with David Goyer as the writer too, I, I sort of feel like they had a uh, a feeling that, look, most of our audience already knows Superman. Yeah. So let's not treat them like, hey, we're re we're gonna... And like in the moment where he becomes Superman, I was like, oh, okay, I guess he's Superman now. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a little bit like, oh, we got here a, a little fast, but sure. But, well, because it, it wasn't like, and this is when he yeah. puts the suit on. Yeah, that's what and I mean. This is when this happened. Like that's you know, what I mean. They, they, they treat them like you know. Look, we know you guys have seen the Superman tale a billion times already. So a lot of the stuff that we have to give you, we're gonna give it to you, but we're not gonna put all our emphasis on that. You know, we're gonna put our emphasis on things you guys haven't explored before, haven't seen yet. So I think that's where some of the disappointments coming in on, where people are expecting an A to B to C origin story because we see so many origin comic book movies now. Yeah. That I think that's what people are. Wanting, but in this one, it's it's kind of got a little bit of a Batman Begins feel with its cutting back between past and present. It's got a lot of it's it's actually a perfect companion piece to Batman Begins, in my yeah. opinion. They don't treat their audience like they're idiots in, in yeah. this film. So I I think some people wanted to see see the same fucking movie again. But yeah, no, like Snyder and Nolan working together, I thought it was a perfect one-two combo. Well, yeah, and, and I've always said this of Zack Snyder: it's say what you will about him. If you give him good material, I think he can make a good movie, and and I think mm. that that is proven again here. It's like left to his own devices, maybe not so much. I know a lot of people don't like Sucker Punch, but this movie, you know, he's got a script from some people who have proven their worth. Yeah. And then you bring in his instincts visually and, and, and for, you know, pacing and stuff like that. And I gotta say, this is the best story I think he's pulled off. He, he usually is more of the visual kind of guy. But in, the, in this particular movie, it, was, it seemed more about the story than the visual feast. Yeah. Which I thought, that's what I was concerned about. I thought it was gonna be just another visual feast. No, it compliments, it, it compliments well. It's great to look at, but it's not like, ah. Oh! Look at that shot and that frame. It, it, it complements yeah. well. It's not distracting in that way. You notice it, but not in a way where it's like, check out how cool our angles are. Because it's not like they, they put, made this visual feast subtle and then they amplified the story. Like, no, they amplified the story, but they also gave us one hell of a visual experience at the same time. So to get both in the same film was awesome. But what I will say, though, about the skyrocketing action is that we have, I think as a Superman fans, we've been waiting for a movie that can pull that off. That's true. Yeah, no, yeah. and I, and, and, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm a bit mixed on it. I'm not saying like, oh, it's bad. Reason is scene number seven. The score. Beautiful music. When I was leaving the theater, I just couldn't get it out of my, yeah, exactly. my head. It's the perfect Hans Zimmer, man. What a composer. Yeah, this dude good. knows how to do it right every fucking time. Yeah, man, I like Hans Zimmer's work, and I, and I think it complements this movie well. It's, it's not a Batman clone, which is nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's got that Superman tone in the, in the music, definitely. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely a different tone, a different feel, and it gives, you know, it complements the movie again. It gives it, you know... An oomph without being distracting. Yeah, it's got it's got that sense of uh, heroism in it, but it also matches the film. This isn't like a heroic movie, I think. Yeah, and, not in that way. Not in like the ha oh, ha. Yeah, like so, yeah, we're gonna be like at the end, like Superman, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But the music still it, it still fits the whole. world. All the music fits the the world perfectly. Even even Zod's kind of like super evil kind of music is is pretty neat too. Yeah, yeah. I like I like it all a lot. You know, like this guy knows how to make theme songs for characters. I remember he he's, he has the Bane song, his Joker yeah. song, and you know he. The, now he has, you know, General Zods and Supermans. So this this dude is just, he's a, he should do every comic book movie. <laughs> Reason to see number eight, Jor-El. They made him way more badass than we've ever seen Jor-El before. The only time I've seen Jor-El this cool was in the Superman Adventures from the 90s. Like, they made him really cool in the, in the cartoon. And I'm so glad they made him a badass in this one, too. Kyle's coming from, you know, DNA from a real genius slash badass. Only makes sense for Kal-El to sort of evolve into that as well. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so they show like, yo, and it's in his DNA. He's, he's gonna be something fucking amazing despite yeah. wherever this guy is. Yeah. Before it was just like, hey, if Kryptonians go to Earth, that's where they become cool. Yeah. But no, it's like, no, there's some Kryptonians who are cool and, and Jor-El's yeah. a big part of why. <laughs> yeah, I mean, their their playing field is different, but I mean, Jor-El, as, as we come to know him, at least through this particular movie, it's like, you know, he's, he's a strong, honorable, 
adorable, smart, you mm -hmm. know, guy. You know, you do get to see him kick a couple asses, but he's also, you know, you can feel the gravity of what's going on in his world, and I think Russell Crowe, you know, brought something good to that character, so. Oh, Russell Crowe does a cool job. Perfectly <laughs> cast, I thought. Mm -hmm. To have him uh, sort of be like an aide to Lois Lane and to Kal-El uh, during a lot of those intense sequences, yeah. that was pretty neat. I, I like how it was more than just a hologram of his face, like what they do with Marlon Brando. Yeah. It was it was actually like a human walking around yeah, and stuff. Jarrell was, he was a cool character, way more fleshed out than I thought even the Marlon Brando character. Sorry, I know it's gonna piss off some of you, but yeah. I thought that he was more intriguing to watch than Marlon Brando's interpretation. He's another great actor in this movie who's not trying to outshine anyone, yeah. you know? Like, he, he does another subtle job and he's another, he's another performance in it that's like, hey, if you pay attention, you'll see he's doing a great job as well. Reasons not to see. Lack of romance. There's just one reason. I mean, you know, everyone is probably expecting, uh, like, a big romantic element in this because that's what we expect from Lois Lane and Clark Kent. But it, it's not really felt in this movie, which I could see being a bummer. But for what they gave in this film, I wasn't too distracted by it. But there are people who are complaining about it how there is a lack of romance, and I, I, I want it on the list because I agree that yes, there is a lack of romance, but there's still like a billion other things that are fucking awesome in this film. Well, yeah, and, I, and their relationship still makes sense, though. That's the thing. It's, it's, it's not a particularly romantic movie. It's not like Lois and Clark are going to go on a date, you know, but... Uh, yeah. but um, you believe the sort of magnetism and the attraction, the intrigue between them. Yeah. You believe the relationship that the movie gives you. It's just not that same, you know, oh, you know, like, roma textbook romantic thing. Ryan's consensus. Man of Steel is the reason movies are made. Man of Steel is the reason movies are made. Yes, I think there's some flaws with it, like, even in the first half hour or so, I thought it was, there was some uneven pacing and some rushing, but at the end of the day, I love like 98% of this movie, so yeah, I definitely think it's one of the best movies of the year. Jerry's Consensus! Uh, I think there are definitely a lot of reasons to see Man of Steel. There are definitely a lot of reasons to see Man of Steel. You know, I, I enjoyed this movie quite a bit. I'm, I'm not in love with it just because, you know, there's, some of the action was a bit much for me, but I thought throughout there's lots of great stuff. I really like the cast and I like the take on the story. Some of those flashbacks had me a little misty-eyed, so, uh, hmm. so it's good stuff. Definitely check it out. Alright guys, thanks for checking out a review from Man of Steel. Why don't you go ahead, scroll that comment box below and tell us. If you saw Man of Steel, what did you think of the movie? Did you love it? Did you hate it? No matter what the opinion is, we just want to know. And uh, once you're done with that, if you want to check out more episodes of Reasons to See, go ahead and click the link right here. And if you want to go ahead and follow us on Facebook, you can click the link right here. Or if you want to follow me, Ryan Wright, on Twitter, click the link right here. And last but not least, if you want to get updated every time a new review or a video is out, subscribe! subscribe. Click this button to subscribe, Superman fans. You know what's cool about the, the mixed reactions on this movie is everyone's lightening up towards Superman Returns. Which I thought was all right. Yeah. I thought well, that movie was all right, and when when it came out, everyone was like, "This is okay." And then a year later, it was like, "Fuck that movie!" Yeah. And so now everyone's going, "You know what? Brian Singer's movie wasn't half okay. bad." <laughs> so I'm happy to see that happen. It, it's one of those movies that's strange. Superman Returns because it has like a 75% on Rotten Tomatoes, yet everyone I encounter is like, oh, "I hated that movie." It's Indiana Jones Four Syndrome. Yeah, right. <laughs> like the movie with good reviews, but no one fucking likes. If Indy Five comes out, everyone's gonna be like, I hate the Crystal Skull wasn't that bad. This <laughs> yeah. sucks. You know, it's like, it's the same thing that keeps happening. But I actually kind of like Superman Returns. It's a love letter, man. I like Superman Returns too, actually, you know? And uh, I don't like it more than Man of Steel. But yeah. I did like Superman Returns. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Brandon Routh, man. Yeah. Tom Cruise looking like... <sighs> He Tom sounds Cruise. like Tom, Tom. He doesn't look like Tom he Cruise. He sounds like He's... Tom Cruise and he looks like Christopher Reeve. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> there you go. That's that's so, the way to do it. It's a weird what-if combination. I like Henry Cavill's American accent in this movie. I do, too. And people were freaking out about that, but, you know, I was like... Kal-El is from a different planet. And his dad sounds so, British, too. <laughs> so, for him to be played by a British actor, he's not American anyway. Like, he grows up in America. It actually seems more fitting to have a foreign actor play Superman yeah, yeah. than an American actor. But that's... Yeah, so it's more identifiable, yeah, exactly. especially when it's taking place in America. Yeah, exactly. All the time. That's a good point. I never thought about that actually. Yeah, yeah right? that's a great point. Thank you. It makes sense for all of that, like Spider, like uh, 
Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man and uh, what you may call it, and, and Bale as Batman. They're all characters who are sort of like lonely people who feel misunderstood and outsiders and stuff. That's true. And so to have them played by British people going in America, it's easier yeah. to get that feeling. But I think I think Henry Cavill has the greatest excuse because it's like you know, Cl it's an alien. already from a different planet. And Jarrell's already Australian. Yeah. So, so yeah. this guy is you know from across the country, across the world. You know, it's mm -hmm. like it makes sense. Uh, so uh, reasons to cast Henry Cavill as Superman. <laughs> yeah, and subscribe. <laughs>